Thank you, Carl. So, and thank you, Jerry West, for uh, the contribution. Today we're going to be talking about restarting the economy versus remaining in lockdown. It, it sounds like I'm going to get in, into a political rant. I'm not, but I am going to talk about some hard realities. Um, bottom line is, I wish it, I really do wish it were that simple, but as you start getting into the details, it's not. Um, <clears throat> things that we've covered recently, yesterday we talked about getting this baby boomer population head wrapped around, I can get healthcare, I can access it uh, at home. Uh, that's the best way to get healthcare, especially right now in uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic and the generation that needs it more than anything, especially for coronavirus, but also for everything else is, um, is the baby boomer generation. The uh, doc doctors all over are opening up on this and uh, patients are starting to open up on this as well. We've also covered ACEs and ARBs, you know, the ACE2 receptor and that fear that uh, the, the most popular in many ways, the most effective blood pressure medicines, the ACEs and ARBs may have been increasing risk for, for uh, COVID-19. Uh, not so clear that that's the case at all. In fact, uh, it may be the pendulum appears to be swinging the other way. Bottom line is I've got a lot of people on those medications. I'm on them myself. And after some initial worries, all of us are saying the same thing. Do not stop your blood pressure medicine. Don't, especially if it's ACEs and ARPs, don't stop the medicine. So, uh, what are we going to be covering tomorrow and in the future? Tomorrow is, um, are we hitting the peak? And I'll just give you a, a hint. My question would be, as I often say, you know, it's not that simple. Which peak? Which peak for which geographic area and which peak within a geographic area? We maybe thought we were hitting peaks in places like New York and Kentucky and a bunch of other places. New York on the high end, Kentucky on the lower end. And after a day or two of starting to see things maybe plateauing, then another big bump. So again, just unfortunately, it's never as simple as we want it to be. Previous topics that we've covered in case you have interest in these areas are zinc, quercetin, vitamin C, vitamin D, several uh, uh, coverage points on uh, hydroxychloroquine, social uh, versus physical dis uh, distancing, herd immunity, heart damage. I think we did heart damage yesterday. Uh, and of course, uh, telemedicine. So uh, today we're going to, again, talk about a New England Journal article that talks about what they did in Hong Kong to manage this uh, pandemic. And uh, they termed it a sprint versus a marathon. Uh, and how a sprint may be turning into a marathon and what we did in New York and how those two things uh, compare and which is a better way. We'll cover that right after this intro from Carl. Uh, this is maybe the most political comment I'll make. And again, it's, it's relatively apolitical. Um, I, as I went down for breakfast, Janice, as she often does, had the TV on checking out the news in the morning. And I heard this uh, rant. Uh, it, it was kind of garbled at first, didn't hear the name, but it was, is not a king. We won't kiss his ring. So you know where I was thinking. I was thinking they must be talking about our president. No, actually, they were talking about the maybe the opposite end of that political spectrum. It was people in my, my own uh, current home state of Kentucky uh, protesting uh, Andy Bashir, the governor here, who's been very aggressive and gotten a lot of kudos for locking down earlier than maybe other, uh, other uh, political leaders. So, you know, it, 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 the political leaders are damned if they do, damned if they don't. And I think part of the issue is um, it's just not that simple. 
we're going to cover that over the next few slides. Um, people are polarizing over saving lives from the coronavirus right now versus saving lives from a gaping, uh, pending economic depression. So I'm going to get a little bit deeper in terms of uh, e uh, pandemic preparedness and balancing those two issues. But to do that, let's just start off with the Hong Kong uh, as we've a, a, an article that was in the New England Journal covering what they did in Hong Kong. Remember, Hong Kong was all wrapped up in their own political problems being taken over by China. We understand that. And that's really taken the back burner now that uh, that COVID happened. This article was written by several people in the uh, public health leadership in Hong Kong. And they basically said, you know what? This all started New Year's Eve 2019. One of us got a text and it said, emerging cluster of atypical pneumonia in Wuhan shared it with the other three and all of us started thinking about uh oh i hope this is not going to be another sars well yes it was another sars and then some uh there was still not a lot of news for the next couple of weeks then in mid-january they started hearing about cases of this same problem in bangkok and then tokyo at that point they knew there was a problem they started doing um trying to figure out, okay, given that, what's actually happening now? Uh, it's, it's called now casting. That was the term they used. And it's a play on the term forecasting. What they were saying is, look, uh, we're not trying to predict the future three months down the road. We're trying to predict mid-January, given the fact that we heard on New Year's Eve that there was a new potential SARS or something like it. And now we've heard that this has already spread to other uh, very different geographic locations. So they were involved in setting up an emergency response plan, which meant a lot of a lot of lockdown, a lot of changes. Um, in January, they suspended all hospital visits. They started travel bans, first with Wuhan and then pretty soon all travel. Medical reporting became a big issue and testing, which we will talk about multiple times. Um, began to be a bigger and bigger and bigger issue within Hong Kong. School closures happened in Hong Kong in January. Closures of theme parks and leisure venues. All of this happened within two weeks of finding out that this was no longer just a text about some potential problem in Wuhan, but that it was a real issue. The uh, government offices were closed. So again, a very rapid response in Hong Kong. Uh, so over the next two to four weeks, this is, this is again, weeks three through seven of them having any significant knowledge that there was something going on. More traveler restrictions, testings, border closures. First in Wu, uh, travel from Wuhan, then Hubei, the whole province, and then anybody returning from anywhere, and then everybody. And as part of that, I'll skip down to testing. First, they started testing everybody coming into Hong Kong, then older people. Why they selected older people, I don't know. Then everybody, everybody in the airport was getting tested, whether symptomatic or not. They canceled all uh, major sporting events. So it was kind of interesting. That took them a little bit longer, uh, relatively speaking, than um, than maybe some of the Western world. I think sporting events, cancellation of major sporting events happened earlier in the process in the Western world. Testing and quarantine procedures. As you know, that's what uh, Hong Kong became well known for. Door-to-door -door testing, all inbound travelers, all asymptomatic travelers. They were testing a lot of people and doing aggressive public health person-to-person follow-up to make sure that the that quarantine was being followed. Um, hospitals, again, within a couple of weeks of finding out this was a problem. Hospitals not only shut down all visitors, but then they shut down anything that was not uh, emergent. So all 
uh, planned surgeries, all of those things got shut down. And it, did I mention testing? Testing and more testing. Hospitals, clinics, special clinics, It again, it started in some places and then grew out. Um, they reopened government offices, what, the last, mid, mid to last part of February, and then shut them down again. And we'll talk about why they shut them down in a few minutes. So they said, you know, that was the sprint, but now the marathon's starting and there's some issues here. You know, I've personally run a few marathons and I started to question some of this analogy about sprint versus marathon. You know, if you run a marathon and you start off with a sprint, you're going to blow up. Uh, this article, fast starts equals slow finishes, Chicago edition. That's talking about the Chicago marathon. And they basically looked at the numbers. Everybody that starts out fast on a marathon ends up very, very slow. So does sprint versus marathon apply to outbreak management? We're going to look at that over the next couple of slides. New York, uh, maybe the opposite end of the spectrum. If, if Hong Kong started off with a sprint, maybe New York started off more at a slow marathon pace, which again would be reasonable if the analogy of a marathon were holding up here. But I don't think it does. The fast start marathon analogy does not work for managing a pandemic. New York started out slow, but then they lost control very, very quickly. Um, they had massive closures. They ended up with field and har harbor hospitals. They had an economic shutdown. And all of these, I think, ended up requiring more focus, more problem, more cost economically, as well as in terms of lives lost than what you saw in Hong Kong. So uh, I don't really think that ignoring the health problems and saying, you know what, oh, we're going to take it as it goes. Other people are overreacting. I don't really think that helped. And guess what? You know, guess what I do for a living? I'm a preventive medicine doc. I deal with this mindset all day, every day. So maybe I'm a hammer and everything looks like a nail. But to me, we can say, look, we're going to ignore the health implications. We're going to just let what happens happen. But to, I have to ask the question, haven't we already seen that in New York? If we just say, okay, let's open up entirely. We're going to get so much transmission, so many cases. Uh, we're going to end up shutting down again, worse off than if we had managed this. So let me, let's go back and look at Hong Kong. Did they manage this better? Oh, again, let's not look so quickly. Hong Kong's not out of the woods. Uh, it's not that simple. They're having a resurgence right now. And guess what? Uh, I don't think it will be that simple. I wish it were. Will New York be better off in the long run? Well, you could say ignoring the medical implications and and just saying, look, we're going to take whatever, we're going to take our medicine, we're going to take our pain. Um, some of that is based on an assumption that we're going to get to a, uh, a herd immunity early on. And, a, and, and with a virus, we covered that yesterday or the, no, the day before, I think. Herd immunity really is going to take uh, with a virus like this that's so um, contagious, herd immunity is going to take 150 million infections in the U.S., 150 million cases. I don't think, well, I, just think, what would 150 million cases look like? Um, and think about whether or not that's going to cost us economically. We're going to end up paying us now, paying now, or paying a lot more later. So New York didn't avoid the economic shutdown. Did they invest less in managing the, the pandemic than 
Hong Kong did coming out of the blocks? No. Uh, now, so you start to see, again, two different paradigms, two different filters looking at this issue. One is similar to the to the uh, quote from Tony Fauci, we don't dictate the schedule when, when things are gonna open up, the virus will do that. Versus some of the people who are saying, look, our business taxes funded those respirators. So uh, if we were to say, look, let's just ditch all of this social distancing, ditch the shutdown, ditch the lockdown, get the, because we're gonna kill people with a bad economy, just like we're killing people with the virus, um, sooner or later, you, you start ha again having to wonder, are we going to get to a, um, a, um, a herd immunity? Again, 150 million cases in the U.S. That's not going, to, that's going to end up like New York started out of the blocks. Such a shutdown that it's going it's to have a bigger impact on the economy than managing this. So what do we do? Do we lock down or do we open up? I really wish it was that simple. It's not. And if you think it is, just open it up and watch what happens. So does the marathon analogy just not work for pandemics? I don't think so. In fact, I think there's another component of the marathon analogy that works far, far better, and that is preparedness. Uh, a far bigger issue with a marathon is that you can't run a marathon without training for it. You can't run one without being prepared. You end up collapsing and not doing well at all. Guess what? Same thing works for pandemics. We had plenty of, re of reason, plenty of warning, plenty of suggestions on what to do, like getting masks available, uh, mask uh, development, mask production available, in places other than one or two places in the world. Same thing for gowns. Uh, same thing for being ready for testing, test kit development. All of these things, we've not done them. Uh, even disaster preparedness in this space. Again, we've not done those, but here's the thing. A couple of positive points. I don't think we're gonna be as unprepared next time. I think this is a wake up call and I think we're gonna do a lot better next time. So some summary points, pay now or pay later, pay a lot more later. New York did less uh, upfront, but more economic disruption because of getting out of control. Starting with a sprint ends up with better control. So the sprint analogy for marathons doesn't work for um, pandemic management. This is a marathon and a sprint. It's not either or. If we just open up everything, we'll end up shutting down even more and we'll prepare better the next time. You don't think there'll be a next time? Wait and see. So thank you again for your interest. I'm gonna go ahead and open this up for comments to see if we have any out there. Let me close out this. Okay. So have faith. Good morning. 147. Good morning. Agnique. Good morning. The Wuhan virus is going around. Dave Murphy. Good morning. So an interview with Ivor Cummins and Dr. Paul Mason question was asked if everyone could eliminate all sugar and carbs for four weeks. What would the boost to immune, immune function overall do to the curve? That's a great question. I wonder what their answer was. Uh, obviously, there's, I, I don't know that there's a whole lot of research which is, gonna, which is gonna give us some quantification there. The Wuhan virus is going around. Jerry West, thank you very much, Jerry, by the way. Jerry gave us a, uh, a $20 donation to help us continue to get this information out there. Speaking of which, I know we're focusing on uh, COVID-19. Um, and this channel up until COVID-19 was focused 
mostly on uh, prediabetes, the bigger epidemic, the epidemic that's killing more people than COVID-19, and the epidemic slash pandemic that's been ignored even more than COVID-19. And it's, again, killing and disabling more people during the time of COVID-19 than COVID-19. So why have we made that transition? We haven't made a transition. Um, we are covering what the healthcare problems that uh, baby boomers get. We've also covered a lot of stuff about uh, sleep management. Um, had a, a lot of sections on um, cognitive decline, a lot of sections on telemedicine, a lot of sections on different things that uh, help people decrease our preventable death and disability. We'll keep covering uh, COVID-19 until uh, readership, viewership starts to decline. Then we'll start managing that. Uh, meanwhile, we're continuing to see patients. Most of our patients are continuing to be heart attack and stroke uh, prevention patients. Our webinars are continuing to grow. We plan to add a new webinar uh, on CIMT. There's still a lot of people out there that got CIMTs, took them to your doc, and your doc said, well, I don't know what this means, and it's not, it must not mean anything if I don't know what it means. Well, obviously, there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there. And uh, again, one of the most popular, one of the most effective ways of, of improving information to help baby boomers decrease death and disability and rectangularize that lifestyle. In other words, maintain a good life, a non-disabled life until you die. Uh, we should be doing a lot more of that. And we can do a lot more of that. It just takes a little bit of knowledge and, and a significant amount of discipline, just like what we saw with, we're seeing with COVID-19. So we're continuing to focus on the things that impact our, um, our health as baby boomers. Jerry West, modeling is incomplete, must include stay at home deaths, for example, or that is MI, strokes, acute abdomen, morbidity and mortality from 2 million or more new homeless out of estimated peak 40 million. Um, the modeling is always incomplete. I agree with that. I'm not really understanding exactly where the point is. It sounds like you might be saying, Jerry, that we're undercounting uh, heart attacks, strokes, acute abdomen, et cetera. Um, it is clear that a whole lot of folks that would have had heart attacks during the age of COVID are getting labeled as COVID cases. Um, but you have to ask the question, how much of that's a miscount and how much of that is an accurate account that this virus happens to result in huge stress on the heart with uh, the acute respiratory distress syndrome and may even be damaging the heart directly, therefore causing a lot of the heart attacks that would have happened maybe a little bit later, a few months or a few years later in a lot of people uh, right now. But yes, there's no question. Anytime you see any kind of models, any kind of healthcare numbers, you have to look at it. And one of the biggest questions is, what's the denominator? It's the denominators that usually get ignored. Dave Murphy, there was a report in our area, healthcare workers being laid off due to elective procedures being canceled due to a saving capacity for C-19 that is not needed at this point, at least around here. Well, the problem uh, it may not be needed from a from a healthcare manpower perspective, but until we've got enough testing to know how much transmission is going on and where it's going on, I don't know how we would know that it's not needed in a in a certain place. You would know two weeks from now if there was transmission going on this week, but if we don't have testing, we don't have testing this week. So we don't know what happened last week in terms of transmission in any area. Uh, hide and eat. I think it's too late, but I was saying back in February that quarantine people should have gone to motels, one person to a room and food brought to the room. Well, you know, they're doing, it's not too late until unless we get to a point where we get significant uh, herd immunity. And that's not, 
and that's not going to happen anytime soon. They are doing that. There are a lot of a lot of places are come. A lot of governments are commandeering hotels and, and doing exactly that. Vix, yeah, a social worker who's a friend of mine in San Francisco said there will definitely be a layoff soon, and my uh, system just jumped. So I, if I skip your comment and you're really concerned about it, please come in again. Same thing happens when you shut down the economy for an extended period of time. It's exactly right. We're talking about deaths on either side and major impact on life, period, on either side of this issue. It's not going to be that simple where we're just doing either or. We're going to have to manage through this. Daniel Wagner, I hope there's not a next time. Unfortunately, Daniel, there will be. <laughs> I hate to be the bringer of bad news, but the thing is, um, yeah, we're going to continue to get uh, development of new viruses. I, I read an interesting article recently about, I forgot where it was. It was talking about why so many of these viruses have come uh, epizootic. Uh, zo zootic meaning animals and epi meaning out of. So this is an epizootic uh, virus. Um, plenty of, uh, black plague was an epizootic. It came from fleas and mice. Um, tons and tons of, uh, oh gosh, what was it, the white powder that they used uh, for a while to, uh, for terrorism? Uh, that's a, a uh, I think sheep shearers disease. It's a it's a a disease that can cause pneumonia and be lethal if it if it causes a, a pneumonia infection in humans. But for the most part, it doesn't. It stays in sheep. Um, the uh, the last virus. In, oh, I'm having another uh, senior moment. The the last potential. Uh, epidemic. SARS-2, uh, MERS-2, all of those came from the camel population and by, well, by way of the cam camel population and from the bat population. So there's actually two different, uh, two different groups of animals that have created the most epizootic diseases in man. That's what I was, after all that tripping and stumbling through rabbit holes, that's what the point I wanted to get to. There are two groups. Guess what they are? One is bats, and the even bigger one is mice or rodents. And what they showed was it really depends on the number of species you have in that animal group. The more species, the more opportunities for um, development of viruses that end up tripping over to humans and becoming an epizootic infection for humans. But yes, Daniel, there will be a next time. There doesn't have to be. I mean, there will be next times. The, the real question is not so much, is there a next time? The real question is, how do we set up our warning systems? How do we set up our surveillance systems? How do we set up our basic pandemic preparedness? I mean, we need to have systems set up where people know how to do what we're doing right now. We know how and when to lock down. We know how and when, uh, uh, to, to look for the right information. We know uh, we don't have all medications, generic medications made in one or two places in the world. We don't have uh, all face masks, personal protective equipment, gloves, all made in one or two manufacturing or uh, manufacturing locations in the world. We need to manage pandemics better. We need to be prepared. Just like somebody who thinks they're gonna be running a marathon, we need to be recognizing and, and realizing that this is not going to be the last pandemic and we need to be better prepared. And I think we will be after this wake up call. Rob T07, on January 14th, the WHO published the Chinese lie that human to human transmission was unlikely. On January 21, Dr. Fauci said it wasn't something we needed to worry about in the US at that time. Yep, there have been a lot of errors. Some of them are I'm sure a lot of these were um, made on purpose. Uh, the Chinese government has demonstrated many times that they are not to be relied on in terms of uh, information.
Rob T07, seven, and good morning. Good morning to you as well, Rob. Vix, did Ford ever mention when he thinks lockdown will be over? Well, it depends on what you mean by lockdown and when, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's part of the whole point, Vix, and that is we call it the lockdown versus opening up. And my perspective is it's not an either or. I wish it were. I wish it were that simple. I think there's going to be gradations of lockdown, both in terms of geography and in time period, and in terms of exactly what's locked down and how, how locked down it is. We're going to get much, much more complicated, much more uh, specific about how we open up for uh, the potential for transmitting disease. I think if we just go ahead, okay, and say, look, we're tired of this. It's screwing up our economy. It's blowing things up. The, these wifty headed public health people don't understand what it's doing. Then what we'll do is we'll just say, heck with all that. We're going to totally reopen the economy. When we do that, we're going to get huge increases in transmission again. And when we do that, we're going to get huge increases in cases. And when that happens, we're going to all feel like failures. And meanwhile, we're going to have more death than we can stomach as a society. And if we, if we said, you know what, we're just going to take the deaths. I think a lot of people in our society could take that and move on. But I don't think our society as a whole could take the number of deaths that would happen if we just opened up completely and started, um, again, more of a damn the torpedoes type of approach. So I think there's clearly going to continue to be debate around that. I think that um, some of the, the open the doors completely, forget the lockdown, damn the torpedoes. I think a lot of that's a little bit um, emotional, just like the other side is emotional. We, we can't have any transmission. We can't have any deaths. We're going to get we're going to get deaths both ways. We're going to get negative impact on our economy both ways. We just need to think through this and manage it um, like it is. A little bit more complicated than simply shut down or open up completely. David Ferguson, monitoring people's body temperature for fever would be fairly easily, easy to do long-term. How effective would it be? How accurate are non-content thermometer, non-contact thermometers? Um, there's clearly, a, it's a good point, David, and it's there's clearly a place for that. And I think that's one of the things that's going to be uh, developed. If you look at St. Augustine, for example, I think it was the mayor of St. Augustine, tiny little town in Florida, um, ended up purchasing a bunch of those. There was also a software, and I can't remember the name of it. And what they were doing was using these uh, non-contact thermometers as a way of predicting whether or not you were getting transmission in an area. And um, again, somebody fact-checked me on that. Somebody sent me that information. I read through it, thought it was very interesting. And I think that group's going to do well. Now, the more testing that we have available, um, the less this temperature management or, or temperature modeling of the outbreak is going to matter. But again, there's always going to be some challenges in monitoring from, a, from testing alone, even if we get unlimited testing. So I do think this is going to be, become a significant tool. What they would do, for those of you who are not aware of it, they would, uh, they would get these uh, non-contact thermometers. They would send the information into a central area, and the central area would start tracking average increases in, in uh, temperature in populations um, within a region. So you could start tracking. And so, for example, in some places, they're saying that their overall average temperature appears to be rising. Well, that appeared also to be predictive of uh, upcoming outbreak events. Chuck K. So when we start opening up the economy, in addition to those who have had the virus, do we start with the young and healthy and 
to get to herd immunity. I, I do think that's going to be a com significant component of it. We talk about how we're going to, uh, to open it up. Is it just open up everywhere all at once at the same time, everybody? I don't think so. I think one of the things that's going to happen is um, those of us who are older, who have prediabetes, who have high blood pressure, who have uh, other risks, are going to be uh, advised to stay in longer. That's my guess, my prediction. Hi, Nick. We had a, we had SARS back in two thousand eight, so they should have been ready with simple masks and gloves at least. No question. Just simple masks and gloves. Read the read chapter thirteen of um, Deadliest Enemy by Michael Osterholm. Um, and there's articles in Lancet. There's articles everywhere. The WHO has, has uh, presented several warnings to us as a modern day society that we know this is going to happen. And actually, as Osterholm predicted, and many others, many of us felt like clearly more corona, coronavirus pandemics were going to happen. We predicted that. And those were a couple of the things that, that we got advice to do. We didn't do them. Randall Weisel, uh, dentist, DDS, MPS, FAGD. Can you come in on, on comment on rapid antibody testing? So it's a very, very interesting uh, point, Dr. Uh, Weisel. Um, so as I, I've mentioned before, I'm uh, working with a large uh, employer now in terms of just this issue. When I say just this issue, I don't mean just rapid antibody testing. I mean, how to start getting people back to work. And I was talking with Doug Thompson this morning. Dr. Thompson, the he's a dentist. Um, he's on the faculty at, um, at the Coy Center, a, large, a, a globally renowned uh, dental uh, uh, continuing education program in a couple of areas, in a lot of areas. One of the bigger things for the economy right now is how do we get started up again? And not, I don't know any space where that's bigger than for dentists. How does a dentist's office get started again? What kind of, you know, Doug was talking about air scrubbers. He was talking about, okay, we generate sprites and mists, which, you know, we don't know who's, when, if and when we start opening back up, we don't know who's going to have uh, COVID infection. And how do we manage that? That's going to be such a big deal for dentists. Um, again, just a shout out and reference to Doug. He and, and the group at, uh, at the Coy Center are starting to do a major set of work on how a dental um, office could, should get started back up. Um, <clears throat> as you may know, we're looking, again, we're looking at that with a large employer. The employer we're working with right now is a financial industry employer. So it was fairly easy to get everybody shut down and back home and they could work, most of them, uh, they could work fairly well from home, much easier than a dentist. But the hard thing is getting that workforce back into the office and figuring out who's safe to come back in and who's not. Here's one of the things that you start with. One is a reliable antibody test. And as you brought out, it's rapid. It's like the, uh, the test for pregnancy. It's a home pregnancy test, except it's for antibody, uh, COVID. Now, like the home pre uh, pregnancy test, any of these home tests, they have faults and positives and faults and negatives. So, you got to remember that. But before you even get there, think about the logic. Do we want to do the PCR test, the, the virus test to see if somebody's infectious? Is that what we lead off with? Probably not at this point in the epidemic. Uh, if you just look from a logical perspective, the first thing would be, well, get an antibody test. If somebody has an antibody test, for the most part, we can say, assuming it's right, assuming it's a false, I mean, it's a true positive, they've had infection, 
and they are developing a, a, an immune response, so they are not going to be um, infectious. Now, what are some ways that could fall apart? One is, is it, is it a false positive antibody test? Another way is, are they just now starting to develop an antibody and are they going to continue to share the virus for a few days to a couple of weeks after that? Both of those are possibilities. So how do you deal with that? It's not going to be so simple. Um, so one of the things you would probably want to do in a perfect world would be not, not to just start off with an antibody test and not just a really good antibody test, but also start off with the antibody test and the viremia or virus or antigen test, the PCR test. Um, that way, if you have a positive antibody test and a negative viremia test, then you say, okay, this person's about as um, safe as we're going to get, as they could possibly get. Um, so do you take uh, two antibody tests to just try to make sure that the first one was a, was a true positive? You know, that's part of where the whole judgment and frustration of trying to work through the details on this kind of program works. Now, Dr. Weisel, I, I did something that I typically do. I mean, you asked me what time it was and I started talking about how to build a watch. I hope that that was uh, helpful in terms of comments. Uh, Erlen, Erlen, how are you doing? Why do hospitals allow hospital staff to wear scrubs outside on the street? In 1970, I was an OR orderly. I would have been fired if I left the hospital with my scrubs on. They carry virus out. Well, I don't know the answer to that. You know, if it were a, if it were a huge problem or, or recognized as a huge problem, you wouldn't see nearly as much of that. I, I will say this, one of the problems was when it became such a stop to wear that out there. And I know that hospitals have come under fire from trying to deal with people where they said, you know what, this is, this is my clothing. I purchased this and this is not the scrubs that I walked out of the hospital with. Um, I, I realize that's not a great answer to your question, but it's a, it's a good question. Dr. Weisel, comment on antibody testing. I think I just did. If you need other comments, please clarify. Thank you. Um, Vix, does he ever read the chat? Or if you're talking about me, that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, BA0700, I am from a very small town in South Carolina. I'm from a small town in South Carolina too, Spartanburg. Maybe not as small as your town. I was delivered by a Dr. Brewer in 1951. Any possible relation? No, I don't think so. There, were, I was, my dad was a postal worker. Uh, my granddad worked for the Telegraph and my grandfather was a farmer. Um, there were no doctors in our family that any of us knew of anyway. John Tocho, here in Minnesota, we have the lowest incidence of COVID, lowest hospitalizations, lowest ICU use, et cetera. The Minnesota model has been a dismal failure. Average age of death in Minnesota is 88. So why has, I mean, low to no COVID, very long lifespan, I don't understand why it's a failure. Every state is different, can be opened differently at a different rate. Yes, thank you very much. That's part of the point I'm trying to get to. But here's part of my concern is, you know what? Uh, I live in Kentucky and Lexington is very, very different from Harlan County in a whole lot of ways and in, will be different in terms of this. So I, I think it's even smaller than a state by state issue. Dr. Weisel again, I'm in Florida. I sent a letter to the governor asking that he mandate dental office to open up for antibody testing. Do you think that would be effective since everyone should be tested? Well, first of all, I think we need to get the test. Uh, that's the problem. Major, major problem. We need to get test availability. You're starting to hear that, oh, we're testing more people than any other country. There's probably some truth in some of those statements, but on a, again, on a 
per thousand basis were just not there. I have worked with many, many groups who are ready, willing, and able to jump out there and start doing testing. The problem is getting the test kits. Now, after we get those test kits, this is America and this is 2020, uh, we're gonna start making those tests, test kits. They are going to become available. And I see it happening in doctor's offices, dental offices, urgent care offices, in a, at home. Um, once that happens, things are going to start getting very, very different. Once everybody and their dog is talking about, well, I had an antibody test, and mine's, but unfortunately, what you're going to see next is two, three percent of the population at most is going to say, yeah, I had a positive antibody test. Then what do you do? Nana Buster, anthrax. Thank you, Nana. You're right, it was anthrax. And again, one of the many, many epizootic diseases. My grandma in Spartanburg, South Carolina, if we did something that she didn't like, like run around in, in the cold when we were wet, she'd say, you're gonna catch the epizootics. I thought that was an old country term that was made up and had nothing to do with anything. Well, you know, like many things, I think that the epizootics when I, when I went to Hopkins, I found out there's clearly a term for epiz... It's not called epizootics, by the way. It's epizootic. And it is a big deal, as we're all finding out right now in terms of the health of man. Uh, North Georgia Mountains, Bob Weiss, good, good to hear from you. Uh, Racine, as in Racine, Wisconsin? Um, if... It, or our economy is ruined. Let's at least quarantine the sick and let the healthy go free. You're seeing a lot of that. And again, there, this is gonna be a big debate for the next, uh, for a long time. Lori B, I've seen jobs for medical screeners as employees enter buildings. Interesting, I think there's, that's gonna grow. Bob Bell, temperatures not a reliable measure asymptomatic spread. That is true. Uh, if you're relying on, I mean, you got to think about each one of these tools that we're talking about, whether the tool is a, a thermometer and what type of thermometer are we talking about? Is it a no touch thermometer? How does that compare to other types of temperature? How does that compare to temperature under the arm, temperature in the mouth? Well, you know, temperature in the mouth may be more accurate but it also is more likely, it's harder to do, it takes longer, and it's more likely to spread disease. So each one of the tools that we have for managing an outbreak has its pros and its cons. Temperature, as we said before, is not nearly as definitive as a test. And then you gotta ask, which test are you talking about? But just, just keep it at temperature versus test. Uh, tests are more accurate, but they're harder to do. They don't give you immediate feedback. They take days or weeks, unless it's an antibody test and an immediate antibody test. And again, uh, they still are not as easy. You can't do an antibody test on everybody walking into a building. So depends on the tool and it depends on the uses. And we're gonna get a lot more detail over the next few months as a culture, as a society, dealing with this issue. Dr. McCord, could you please comment on the availability of any COVID-19 testing platforms that combine detection of virus? Mm. Dr. McCord, I cannot, um, I wish I could, and I expect to be taken to school by a couple of fellows on that very issue, IgM versus IgG. IgM is, you have, um, Again, maybe somebody remind me, There's, there are two types of immunity. One is adaptive immunity, which is the development of specific antibodies and specific reactions. And then there's the, I can't, maybe, I can't remember the other term, but the other term is the immunity before you get to adaptive immunity. Um, so if you look at diseases and you look at antibodies, I, I went through that with uh, testing a few weeks ago. For the first couple, it usually takes about 14 to 21 days, usually about 14 days to develop IgM, which is your early antibody. And somebody fact check me and make sure that I don't have it backwards. And then another, 
another seven days or a total of 21 days for IgG. That's the typical um, thing that you see. Now with an infection like COVID and with most of the infections, what you'll see is you'll see the infection today, day zero, and then an increase in viremia, virus emia, meaning in the blood, increase in virus in the blood until about day, uh, usually day 14 when you start getting the development of that adaptive immunity. As soon as you start developing the antibodies, then the infectiousness decreases. You may still remain infectious, especially with COVID-19. There appears to be a lot of people that remain infectious for days or even weeks afterwards. But you start that, that antibody development at about two weeks, and then the infectiousness begins to decline. At three weeks, uh, you become, it becomes much more of a long-term type of uh, immunity. As with everything, you have, start, have to, you have to start asking the question, what does, quote, long-term mean? And um, I read another article, which is very interesting, about what we already know. You know, you get a lot of this stuff about, are we getting, um, does immunity actually even work for COVID-19? And you've heard several uh, episodes and several stories about people that got over it and then got it again. Well, especially, we know a little bit more than we think we do. We know what, what goes on with some of the other coronaviruses. And is typically, we don't know a lot about all of them, but we've, there have been several studies. You see, coronaviruses are more than just SARS and MERS. Coronaviruses are endemic already in um, some of the coronaviruses. They cause uh, some of the, what, what we call common colds. Some of the coronaviruses do that. Um, and there's been studies which would indicate that for the most part, we have fairly good um, long-term immunity. So in the past, I think it was 1970, 1980, 1990, 96, 99, they did studies with some specific coronavirus species. They looked to see uh, when somebody got infected this year and then waited until the following year and reinfected that individual with that same coronavirus species. For the most part, they had little to no infection. With some of the coronaviruses, they had hardly any. With others, they had a little bit more disease, but they also had um, a greatly decreased uh, level of disease. So one of the things that we're beginning to, to find as we start looking through what we know already, uh, there's very, it's very likely that uh, if we can get a vaccine that works, uh, that most people are going to have uh, significant long-term immunity, at least for a year or two. Now, uh, in a year or two, obviously, will buy us a lot of time in terms of understanding this virus, understanding how to manage it better. Again, pardon the bunny hole, but I, th I think it was uh, stuff that was worth worth discussing. It's also stuff that we're, we need to be aware of as we think about development of a vaccine. <clears throat> One of the things that gives me pause as we think about vaccine is, is the next Thing I'll mention, um, <clears throat> and that is amplification. Um, and one of the things I had not thought about until reading a, that that specific article was some immune uh, reactions can give you amplified uh, disease, especially if the if the larger part of the disease is based on. Uh, inflammation, which COVID-19 is. So um, I've been thinking up until what last night or the night before when I read that article that we're probably going to relax some of our uh, very conservative um, human trials on vaccines. And I haven't understood why people are not talking about that. Here's one of the reasons especially for a, a virus like uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, where you have COVID-19, which is a very inflammatory type of process, 
you want to make sure that we don't develop a vaccine which heightens the person's response to the virus when they do get infected. And that's, again, I think one of the biggest um, things we're going to have to look out for as we develop a vaccine in this space. Dave Murphy, if we're worried about diabetes, prediabetes, cardiovascular deaths, and change the diet recommendations and lifestyle to correct it, the C19 deaths would drop dramatically, in my honest opinion. Thank you, David. It's like, I mean, that's what I keep saying. We call this a totally different unknown outbreak. No, it's not. It's yet another final common pathway or final end pathway for death for people that have prediabetes. Heart attack has been the first and most common and still is the most common way of, uh, of final uh, mechanism of death for people with prediabetes. Strokes are a mechanism of disability for people with diabetes. Going on the rest, I mean, going on, uh, on dialysis is for people with diabetes. Number one cause of people going on kidney failure, diabetes. Number one cause of blindness, diabetes. So the problem here is not coronavirus, it's not uh, blindness, it's not kidney disease, it's not heart disease, and it's not um, stroke. It's diabetes. John Golf, America sends twice as much as everyone and also have twice the heart disease. Um, I think maybe you're saying spends twice as much on healthcare. And yes, as long as we're continuing to spend so much money on the wrong kind of food and eating it, and yeah, we're going to die with heart, heart disease. John Golf, only people with se severe issues who are already close to death are dying. So part of that assumes, I mean, that sounds like one of the guys that would say, let's open up. And I, and part of me thinks that way as well. Again, as I continue to work through this and you work through this, you know, for example, we already mentioned it. A lot of the folks that would have had heart attacks are now being labeled as COVID-19 because the COVID-19 is pushing them over the edge. Um, at, are we as a society ready to take that hit in terms of opening up and saying, we know we're going to get a lot of deaths. Were we able to do that in New York? Bart Robinson, wrong. It has killed many young people. There's no question it's killed a lot of young people. It's not only old people. Um, it's certainly not like Spanish flu. Spanish flu, it, it, it appeared that part of the risk associated with Spanish flu was being young and having a very healthy immune system. SARS-CoV-2 is not at all the same. So I've got a friend joining, uh-oh, she's coming in smiling just so and getting dressed so it looks like she's gonna come teach me what i should be saying right? yeah, you know? i just wanted to say hello hello how are you doing good Anything? sorry i was practicing my lifestyle behaviors this morning which one was that i did a pilates mat class live at the y via zoom and then i did a zoom tai chi so you weren't at the y no. to clarify no. you did it via zoom correct remote uh, remote Tai Chi and remote. Well, Tai Chi was a discussion. Pilates. It's really hard to do it in the screen. And Very I did good. have an interruption during that. <laughs> you had an interrupt. Who interrupted you? You did. Okay. I don't want to interrupt you. Well, you already did. Okay. John Tucho was talking about the Minnesota forecast model, which was off by board. Oh, I see what you're saying. John was saying things were doing great in Minnesota and it was a disaster. He was talking about the model. You know, that I think probably the University of Washington model, maybe, John, uh, it was off by orders of magnitude. The governor's still relying on the wrong forecast. Yeah. Uh, num what was that? They said statistics don't lie, but liars use statistics. You know, you got to statistics lie, too, if you just take them on face value. Uh, 
Alex J. Hello, doctor. Considering half of the population is undiagnosed pre-diabetic, that's a very good thing to consider. That would make half of the population a risk group for COVID-19. Any comments? You got any comments on that? Well, we've seen that in the statistics. We have. Um, to me, that's the most, oh, go ahead. That and obesity, high blood pressure, heart disease. There's a newer article out on obesity I have yet to read, but as we've discussed previously, people think you get diabetes after you're obese, but it really is the other way around. It, it can be. It can be the other it way It can around. be the other way around. Just like with gum disease, people think they get gum disease because they have diabetes. There's evidence that gum disease can create it. Um, someone started off these comments by saying, uh, there was an interview with, uh, um, oh, what's his name? Everybody watches my channel and his, there's so, so much overlap between, oh, Ivor Cummins interviewed a, a doctor named Dr. Mason. And they were talking about, guess how many people, guess how much COVID-19 death rate would decrease if people just quit eating carbs and watch their diet just across the country. And I think it's a great question, you know, and then I, I start having a bunch of questions myself. So over what time period? You know, if you're talking about the next two to four years with COVID, if everybody were to stop now and start managing their diet, it's like, well, think what would happen in terms of heart attacks. Think what would happen in terms of strokes. It, it would be the one thing that would impact our health more than anything else. And I want to say it's not just diet. It's diet, it's exercise, it's sleep. You know, we've tied in the cortisol effect to um, elevated blood sugar. You know, people that don't get enough sleep, it's stress, also creates a cortisol effect. It's all of the um, behavior that goes around next time. But diet is number one, two, and three. Right. I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying... The others do help as well. There's no question. And all of those are, any one of those is three times more important than that form. So Mike Martyr, interstate travel needs to be considered. Car travel is typhoid Mary revisited from centers of infection to uninfected regions. Any kind of travel. I mean, they, that's why they shut down airports because that's how this is happening. And you're right. And they have done that in certain states. Uh, yeah, describe that uh, just briefly, because I remember you talking about that between Kentucky and Tennessee. Well, I don't know about that, but my sister lives in Delaware. What, what do they do? They have state troopers at the various um, highway entry points into Delaware because of the rate of infections in New, York and New Jersey. So what do they do? They stop you if you are on the highway from New York to Delaware? I guess they're looking at license plates. I don't know for sure. But they do that have something would be in interesting. They do have that, something that looks like that would be a challenge, it's, well, especially in a rural state like us, where you have all kinds of little circuitous roads going in and out. Yeah, I've had a few questions about uh, the no-touch thermometer versus the swipe across the forehead thermometer. I, I I've never liked either one that much, but again. I've never been considering those in terms of pandemic management. Um, I do, I, I, I do think there's a lot of opportunity, especially for the no touch. But we were also talking about. You remember that that software? It, it's paired with the no touch thermometer, and it, whenever somebody gets a temperature, they send it to a central region, and it starts tracking the average temperature in a region. Remember, the mayor of St. Augustine bought a bunch of those. Hmm. You didn't hear about that? No, I didn't. I told you about it. You just didn't remember. Or I didn't listen. You're, well, I was trying to be nice. <laughs> Kevin McCord, IgM equals acute immune response, acute, adaptive. And then there's the pre-IgM, which is labeled something else, and I can't remember. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, IgG equals long-term, yeah. 147, you compare New York City and San Francisco... New York waited too long to shut down. Yeah, and again, I don't think that it really ended up uh, helping them long term. Dr. Reisel, dentist, we were talking about dentistry this morning. Do you believe in a model for screening of risk factor for, 
for diabetes, high blood pressure, CIMT, and sleep apnea may be effective. Of course I do. Do uh, Dr. Weisel, you ought to get in touch with Doug Thompson, the well, Wellness Dentistry Network. He and I have done a lot of uh, uh, things in terms of encouraging dentists to do, for example, hemoglobin A1C. Uh, offer that type of testing in a dental office. Uh, he, that's what the Wellness Dentistry Network is all about. It's that interaction between oral health and systemic disease. And PrevMed has consulted with various dentists where we've gone to their practices and met with their patients and with their employees. And they have actually gone through our preventive medicine workup. Yeah. And we're continuing to do that. We had another conference planned in Ohio with a dentist. Mark, Mark Bentley. That we uh, had to postpone due dentist, to the virus. Yeah, dentist in Ohio. Dan Deutsch uh, a, runs uh, Washington, uh, what is it? Is it Washington? It's a big uh, Washington dental group that manages uh, dental care for a lot of, group, uh, a lot of folks. Um, Steve Acker in uh, New York. So several different groups. Erland FR, three stages of truth, ridic ridicule, violent opposition, and accepted as self-evident. We've got a lot of learning, that kind of learning going on right now, don't we? Erland, do we have time for this to take place? The acceptance of truth, you know, I think that's, that's a good point. I think that's part of the problem. It'll be hammer and dance, open, lockdown, open. Right now, Fairbanks is four days of zero new cases. I think you're right, 147. I think what's going to happen is we're not going to wrap our heads around the fact that it's not so simple. It's not just open everything up or lock it down. It's got to be much more nuanced than that, but we're not going to wrap our heads around it until we learn the hard way a few times. It has to be based on data. Yeah. And you open it up, you start getting transmission, you start documenting it, then you're going to learn your lesson and say, okay, well, we got to slow down a little bit. On the other hand, we're getting plenty of data from the economy, which is showing us some of the problems we've got going on there. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Martyr, how do I know you're cleared for reentry into the public? An implanted microchip. Somebody, that's not as outlandish as it sounds. Somebody was recommending that. Do you carry Z papers, flashing them at me like an old Bogart World War II movie? How about counterfeit credentials? Well, I tell you what, as soon as credentials are developed, counterfeits, mm -hmm. counterfeits will be right at, right behind. Open too early without a mollifying therapy, we, we will be playing whack-a-mole forever eating up resources. You're exactly right. We should stay COVID free, assuming out of state travel is kept at zero. And uh, for those of you who are wondering, she's from Alaska, mm -hmm. 147. Mm -hmm. Oh, Dave Murphy. Hello, Janice. W was it Dave Murphy that was called, said hello to your daughter? Or was that hiding me? I think it was Dave. Hi, Dave. Um, I thought you were talking about my daughter. I did not think you were talking about Janice. Karen Black, Dr. Brewer, because of your videos, my husband and I are both, both got our CIMTs last year and have a second one scheduled for June, all through cardio risk. Thank you for your great info. Thank you very much, Karen. I, uh, one of the things I was saying is that some people are asking why so much on COVID-19, because there's demand for it right now. Have mm -hmm. we stopped our, our cardiovascular stuff? Not no. at all. You and, you and I were talking about that today. You want to make a comment about that? Well, even with this COVID-19, we're always getting back to the point of pre-diabetes and prevention and how, you know, pre-diabetes is a comorbidity with COVID-19. So there's um, plenty of work that we are still doing on the prevention forefront. Right. With pre-diabetes, heart and stroke, risk. The webinar continues to grow. Uh, uh, people are distracted right now with COVID-19 right. for obvious reasons. But right before you came in, I was making the point that, you know what, whether it's heart attack or stroke or COVID-19 or kid, uh, kidney failure or blindness, these are all basically just the same thing. They are uh, an end organ failure 
associated with diabetes and prediabetes. And we have we have our webinar series. We have a new one available on inflammation and insulin resistance that is listed on the tape going across the bottom that we just put out a week ago. And we need to get uh, we're looking at getting a, a CIMT webinar started up. Right. I typically keep pushing my folks. Well, we need a, CI, a CIMT webinar. We need to get the regular uh, IR webinar up and rolling. We need to get our book completed. We need to get and I just keep our folks dizzy. Uh, so Janice and Michelle are focusing more on making sure that we're all doing the right thing and managing to a plan, which I'm not very good at. Hi, Karen. She said hello to me. Oh. Uh, Mike Martyr, the, the young have minimum four comorbidities, insulin resistance, carb-rich, nutrient-deprived diet, overweight, and diagnosed. No wonder the young are part of this pandemic. Exactly. And I agree. I think it's a great question. I mean, it's, I, I haven't dealt with it that much, but theoretically, if we all just started watching our health, managing our health appropriately, what would happen? And in regards to minimum, that UCLA article showed that um, people as young as 30 years old, half of them had prediabetes. Yeah. Well, well, you're talking about the UCL, I said. That's what it just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I missed that part. So, a AL, um, do you think taking an ACE inhibitor can protect someone from severe COVID-19? I think if that were the case, they would have seen it. They've studied it enough now to where actually the pendulum swung both directions. It swung in terms of saying, oh, it upregulates or increases our ACE2 receptors, therefore it increases our risk. Then others say, no, you know what, don't stop it. It probably does protect you. And I think there's some truth to that, that it does protect you. So I wouldn't recommend stopping it. I'm on benazepril. Uh, I'm not stopping mine. But um, I don't think that it's clear enough that we ought to all start taking ACE inhibitors. I don't think it's that strong of a, of a concept. Skunk Ape, good name, great picture. I'm staying in my hole until the herd thins out. Dave Murphy, no, it was me, and I was referring to Janice. Well, I obviously didn't get it, Dave. It took um, you a couple days. My sister had to explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought he was talking about my daughter. Sometimes I'm literal. Oh, Captain literal. literal. Main Shire, ah, if we can test for antibodies, then we'll find out what the death rate is. Less that the death, we will, then we will truly find out that the death rate is less than flu. We may find that out. Right, Radar, Radar Anderson, hi, you might have talked about vitamin D and how it can perhaps give some protection, improve immunity, yes. A study found deficiency of vitamin D in people who died from C19. I'm not surprised. Um, we've had several videos on supplements. Vitamin C, major debate around that. Vitamin D, not so much debate. I think most people are agreeing that, yep, vitamin D will help. Um, the question is how much and in, in comparison to what other things, but it's like this thing we're continuing to bring up. You, you do the right lifestyle things, including the right supplements, vitamin D, uh, vitamin C, um, proper exercise, proper sleep, uh, proper weight, proper, uh, carb management on a day-to-day -day basis for those of us who cannot digest carbs, it'd be a whole different ballgame. Bart Robinson, I live in rural South Jersey, 20 minutes from Delaware and shop over there quite often. At my favorite beer store, state police are giving warnings to out-of-state drivers in various other places. So there's his personal experience in Delaware. You mean the beer store or the... Yeah. <laughs> no, the warnings. Yeah. Yeah. There is, in other words, there is some of that going on. So we're getting on 1214. I thought today was going to be a short day, but um, I was too long winded, I guess. A lot of interest. I certainly appreciate the interest. And you have anything else to say before we go? No. Thank you for joining us, Janice. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.
Thank you, Carl. Have a good evening. Thanks, Mark. You too. Bye-bye.